Thank you. Thank, thank you for, for inviting me. It's an honor, of course, it's an honor, especially because I'm not a, theolo- a theologian. So I <laughs> I'm a logician, so when, when Bartosz invited me to write this paper, it was really it was funny for me to accept. And in fact, the paper and the presentation is, is an exercise uh, of epistemic logic for clarifying the notion of God's omniscience. Um, because in the li- as I was saying before, you know, uh, in the literature I didn't find, we didn't find, uh, Erika and I, uh, any basic but clear definition of God's omniscience. So I think it's still something to be done, especially in a logical perspective. And it was funny also because uh, in this paper uh, we had to proceed in the opposite direction of, of the direction which is usually taken by logicians. As I was saying, uh, usually logicians modeling uh, the notion of knowledge and belief try to avoid omniscience. Because omniscience assumes that, you know, agents know much more than humans usually know, right? Uh, so one of the po- points in epistemic logic is to avoid or at least to, to reduce as much as possible the, pro- the problem of omniscience. Here we had the, we had to, 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 to follow the opposite direction, so we had to proceed in order to push to, ex, to its extreme uh, the notion of knowledge. And so in this paper, in this paper, in this presentation, um, all right, we basically address this issue. We, we try to define the notion of omniscience, the God's omniscience, in, a, in uh, epistemic logic. And, the, and this is the layout of the presentation of the paper. So first, we, I proceed presenting some, preliminary, pre, some com, I mean, will comment some uh, uh, aspects of God's omniscience as defined in analytic philosophy, because there are papers in analytic philosophy addressing the issue of God's omniscience. So the perspective, of course, of analytic philosophy, may, uh, and for obvious reasons, uh, logics can be easily applied in, in this perspective, not in other types of perspective. Um, then. I will, I will show you how to capture different aspects of, of the omniscience in model epistemic logics. I will give you both uh, axiomatics and uh, uh, semantics for that. There is nothing really new from a technical point of view here, but there, there is something new in how to interpret some aspects of epistemic logic in order to, to understand the notion of all God's omniscience. Um, the, the way in which we proceed, and I proceed in the presentation, is to define sort of ascending stairway to divine omniscience. So we start with the, the weakest definition of omniscience we may have in, in, in epistemic logic, and then we add building blocks in order to strengthen, to have a stronger version of omniscience until we reach divine knowledge. Uh, in that sense, we model, we use two different versions of, of, of epistemic logic, normal and non-normal. This, this terminology comes from modal logic. Uh, it's not important to, 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 have a, uh, to stick this terminology if you, if you dislike. Fair enough. Uh, and we will address, I will address two points. The first point, which is classical in epistemic logic, is the point of the problem of logical omniscience. You know, usually this is the, the, the topic of epistemic logic, and is also a topic in, 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 uh, in model, for modeling uh, the God's knowledge. Another, another, and well, less investigated issue is the problem of factual omniscience, which is crucial for characterizing the notion of uh, God's omniscience. And um, the reason why it's less investigated is that uh, if, we, if, we want to, if you want to mo- properly capture the notion of factual omniscience, I will give you a definition of that, of course. Uh, you will discover that model logic is useless. Probably logic is useless. Um, okay, so I give you three uh, definition, not definition, because I, I don't need now to define the uh, omniscience, God's omniscience at the, the moment. But what I, I, I want to, to, I want to put to your attention is, is to bring to your attention is that some aspects that are well known in the literature on, uh, on, on uh, the notion of omniscience in terms of divine omniscience. Alvin Plantinga, for example, or Gale, in, uh, much later, says that. Pa- if, if you want to define God's omniscience, you should pay attention to the fact that God believes in no falsehoods. Okay, so in some, somehow um, the, 
God's epistemic infallibility is important in defining God's omniscience, right? The fact that you, you have infallibility is, is required, okay? You can't, you, you can't give up the notion of infallibility, right? Uh, a, second defi- a second definition, a second aspect of the, uh, the, the problem of God of Mises, uh, which was uh, po- uh, pointed out by Van Gartner and Bier- Bieringa in, in very recently, is that God knows all truths. So in other words, everything is true, is known by God. Okay? And the third definition is that God's knowledge is maximum. Alright? So th- th- this, this comes from the idea that God is a perfect being, the Perfect knowledge implies maximal knowledge, right? Uh, what we mean by maximal knowledge is still uh, is unclear, right? Of, I will give you uh, a clarification of what we mean from a logical perspective by maximal knowledge. How many? Log- uh, I mean, because if you are a logician, if you, if you had the opportunity to read uh, books or papers in logic, you immediately guess that maximality is what you, what you need when you prove completeness of, a, of, of, of logic, so you try to build, uh, uh, to prove Lindenbaum, uh, Lindenbaum uh, lemma, right? It you know, has to do with this, more or less. So the point is how to define this, this concept, right? Okay, so this is basically what I did, I, I did in this paper. Uh, okay, so let's take the notion of belief for the moment, right? Uh, this is one issue, right? Distinguishing between knowledge and belief. This is a classic issue in epistemic logic. You may have knowledge, you may have belief. I will see, uh, we will see later what me, how to differentiate that is, is a standard in epistemic logic. But just to start, let's consider belief. You know, let's take a, this expression, belief, bell x a, which means bell is a model operator and means agent x believes that a is true. Okay, this is an expression, model expression capturing the notion of belief. Um, this is a standard way of representing uh, um, in model in epistemic logic, epistemic uh, knowledge and beliefs. Uh, so the question, the question is, for example, what do we mean by this is a standard notation in epistemic logic? What do we mean that belief, the fact that X believes that A is true, is true in a world W? So basically, we want to establish the condition under which an agent uh, uh, the, the expression believe, uh, agent, a believe, agent X believes that A is true, okay? Uh, usually, in epistemic logic, to gi- this means, this means, this is a, okay, this is a model, a, a, a semantic structure you use to interpret uh, uh, epistemic expression like this. This is a world, you know, in, in a possible world so, semantics, this is a, a world of the model, this means it's, uh, it's a semantic expression meaning makes true, and it's the expression we want to, to assess. In other words, the expression means what, under what condition in the model M in the world W belief X A is true? Okay, we want to establish the truth condition for the expression the agent X believes that A. Okay. When can we say that this, is, this expression is true in this, in this structure? I will give you later on uh, how, wh- what, do you, what do you mean by that. But what I, would, what, what, I would like to po- what I would like to point out now is that usually impossible word semantics, which is the semantics used in epistemic logic, the fact that we have more worlds, you know, this is, I assume that you have a, a, at least a rough, a rough background in the notion of possible words. You know, you, know, you, you could also trace, trace, trace back this to Leibniz if you want, right? You may have more than one possible word, right? The, in epistemic logic, the fact that you, you have more words depends on the fact that usually agents are ignorant. So that they don't know everything, you know? This is a standard example of epistemic law. Suppose agent I lives in Paris and doesn't know if today it is raining in London, right? I'm in Paris, I don't know what is, what, how is the weather in London, right? If I don't know that, I can imagine two possible situations, right? Two epistemic alternatives. The first, the first in which in London it is raining, and the second in which in London it is not raining. I don't know what's going on in London, right? So what, if I am ignorant, I should imagine two possible situations, right? One in which it, it is raining, one it is not raining. This is usually the classical, definition, the classical justification in, in epistemic logic why we need possible words, okay? Possible words imply a, a plurality of words, to, 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 to quote uh, David Lewis, in epistemic logic implies 
having more epistemic, stand, epistemic alternatives, right? This is due to ignorance, the ignorance or the partial knowledge of agents, okay? As you may guess, if you want to model God's omniscience, you should probably remove the, the, the assumption that we have plurality of words. This probably, but we will, we will see this at the end of the, at the end of the talk. Um, so, in a pictorial view, uh, possible world semantics for epistemic logic works in this way. We have worlds, you know, the circles are worlds. You should establish whether in this world, in the current situation, I believe that A is true, W is the situation where I am. To evaluate this, this sentence, I should check whether A is true in all possible alternative states. Okay? This is standard epistemic logic. So, if, in other words, this situation, in this situation, in epistemic logic, I don't, it's not true that I believe that A is true. Because the truth of the sentence, I believe that A is true, depends on the fact that in all my epistemic alternatives, A is true. Okay? This is standard in epistemic logic. You, you have more alternatives, the alternatives are justified by the fact that you, 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 we, may be, uh, we may have a partial knowledge about what, 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 uh, what is true, what is wrong, uh, what is false in our world. So we imagine possible alternatives. But when I believe, when I believe that A is true, this implies that in all my alternative, epistemic alternatives, okay, A is true. Okay? This is standard, so if you dislike it, fortunately, unfortunately, it is a, it's a bad start because <laughs> it's impossible to communicate. Uh, so, as I said, a first source of ignorance is having a plurality of words. In other words, if you have a plurality of words, this means that we are modeling agents not equipped with full omniscience, right? Having more words implies having ignorant or uh, ages not perfect. Okay? There is another source of, of, uh, of ignorance, a another way for modeling ignorance. The fact of having more than one accessibility relation. Um, here, in this picture, you, you see two arrows, right? So you, can, you have a world and you have arrows connecting the other words, right? This arrow is just a single relation. So we have a way for reaching alternatives, okay? It's a single relation. Uh, but when you have uh, more, more than one accessibility relation, you have what we call epistemic standards. So we have different standards for imagining, for building alternatives, okay? Hmm? I will give you an example later on, okay, to, 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 to uh, and this is the example. I, I, we took the, an, an example from uh, Hector Neri Castaneda, who wrote uh, a nice paper in 90, 1980. Uh, the example is not from theology, but you know, it's just to give you a hint. And, uh, Castaneda says, what counts as knowing that Cristoforo Colombo discovered America on October 12, 1492, might change depending on whether we have different types, different standards, different epistemic standards. Okay? For example, you may have a television quiz standard. In that perspective, it's plainly, plainly true that I believe that Cristoforo Colombo discovered America in, 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 uh, on that date. Right? Because what we learn in, high, in uh, primary school, right? But Suppose you want to defend, to defend this traditional dates of America from a, you know, a quite revolutionary uh, Harvard historian who has pieces of evidence showing that it wasn't uh, October 12, but it was October 13. According to that standard, I could admit that I believe or I, I know that it's not true that Cristoforo Colombo discovered America on October 12. The idea is that depending on the standards, epistemic standards, I may believe that Cristoforo Colombo discovered America in October 12, but at the same time I can believe, according to a different standard, that this, is what, this wasn't true. 
Okay? I, you get, you, do you get the point? The point is, different standards may consistently allow me to depict agents which at the same time believe that October 12 was the day where, when America was discovered and at the same time I can believe that this is not true depending on my perspective, right? If I go to a telev television quiz, right, fair enough. If I dispute, argue with this historian, probably it's not, it's not sufficient, okay? So, um, you may understand why, if you want to model God's omniscience, you should not have a plurality, a plurality of relations. Because the plurality of relation implies another form of ignorance, right? Does it make any sense for an omniscient go, uh, uh, being to say, well, if I'm in television quiz, I can believe that uh, uh, discover, uh, Colombo discovered America on that date. But if I'm disputing with a, a historian, no, I, I, be, I, I could believe the opposite. If I'm, I'm omniscient, there is just a single truth. And I know it, or I don't know it. Okay, so does it make sense in a divine perspective to have more epistemic standards. Is somehow having more epistemic standards means having an ignorant agent. Okay? But this is important because if you want to, if you want to model uh, omniscience in model logic, you start with logic where you have epistemic standards. Okay? Okay, so if you want your epistemic standards, so here is this, the, the, the picture, but it's different, right? You have two different types of arrows, the red arrows and the blue arrows. These are two different standards. The, blue, the, the red arrow is one standard, television quiz, whatever. The blue arrow is the other, the other standard, right? So you have words connected by different arrows, okay? Different types of arrows, different uh, uh, standards. So suppose you have this situation. This situation doesn't, make, doesn't validate the fact that I believe that A. But, this situation, yes. Here I have a, a standard, the blue standard, whatever you, you want, the television, whatever, or historian, an epistemic perspective. All words connected by this standard make A tr true. So in all epistemic alternative, alternatives, A is true. So, this is true. Okay? It's enough to have just a single standard. Okay? Okay, this is just technical stuff. I, I think we can skip it. Okay, so, uh, one technical note. Uh, you may have a different semantics for epistemic logic, for the weakest epistemic logic I use, which is neighborhood semantics. Okay? Uh, I prefer to use this multi-relational semantics in which you have more relations. This is mathematically equivalent to neighborhood semantics, but is more intuitive. Because in that, in that way, you, you may have accessibility relations, so you can easily model the notion of epistemic standards. Another technical note, multi-relational semantics, so namely semantics where you have, sorry, where you have more accessibility relations, was originally invented by Scott and Jennings in the 80s for modeling, for modeling the ontic logic. The idea, the idea was the following. You have more relations because you may establish that something is obligatory according to different norms. You may have a norm stating that it's obligatory to pay taxes. You may have another norm stating that it's not obligatory to pay taxes. You know, this happens every day you know, in the law. You may find inconsistencies in the law, right? So the idea was to introduce many accessibility relations as, uh, to model the, the plurality of norms. You, you have different norms producing different obligations, okay? So we, we found quite natural to uh, import this, uh, this intuition into epistemic logic, right? And we used an, a new version of, of the semantics, uh, which, which is, was developed by, by uh, myself and other colleagues, but it's not important. Okay, the minimal epistemic logic is this, which is, by the way, the minimal model logic you may have. This inferences is 
means uh, if A and B are logically equivalent, then oh, okay, I use this this symbol box to represent any type of epistemic operator, belief, knowledge, I don't care. You can take it as belief or you can take it as knowledge. Because at, at this stage, we have not yet defined what, what we mean by knowledge and belief. We have both, right? Um, this is a minimal, minimal uh, inference you may have. If you, don't ha if you don't have that, you don't have modal logic. Okay? Uh, this, same, this inference rule is very strong and very weak at the same time. It's very strong because, in other words, it says that if A is equivalent to B, if I know or I believe A, then I know I believe B. You, you, could, know, you could know A, but how, how you could know A, but it's far from obvious that you know that B is logically equivalent to A. Okay? In that sense, this is already a version of omniscience, because assume that the knower or the believer you know, has a strong mastery of what, what, uh, what equiv logical equivalence means. But from a logical perspective, it's very weak as well. Because in, uh, in classical logic, in, in mo most logics, you know, if you, if you have two sentences that have precisely the same truth values, for any assignments of truth values, they are in fact equivalent. And in propositional logic, they are in fact identical. If I say A implies B, and if I say not A or B, from a classical propositional logic perspective, they are identical. They don't, the first sentence, A implies B, doesn't say anything more than not A or B. They are logically equivalent, they get the same truth value in for any possible assignments, they are the same. So in some sense, very strong, but very weak. Okay? But if you, you, you can't, you can't uh, give up this rule, otherwise you don't have any model logic. Okay, this is just, this is just an example that shows that if you assume this, just only this inference rule, the semantics you have allows to state consistently that the agent believe, believes A and believes not A. Okay? So I may, I may, I can believe that A is true and that not A is true. Okay? Why? Because I have many epistemic standards. Okay? For example, here I have two epistemic standards, R1 and R2. R1 makes a, a true, R2 makes not A true. According to this standard, which is for example a television quiz, it's true that uh, uh, Colombo discovered America in 2000 and, uh, October 12. According to standard R2, no. And I, may see, I, I, I can say that consistently. Okay? So this logic, this minimal logic, tolerates cognitive conflicts. Right? Of course, we don't have. We, we, this is not acceptable in case of uh, divine knowledge. It's quite clear. But you know, the point is that if you want to give up this, you should know uh, precisely what you leave, what you renounce. It, right? Um, other steps. This is an, an easy step. I, okay, we are proceeding in an ascending stairway to heaven. Just to, to give an, uh, to to quote. Um, uh, this is the first step. This step is quite easy. Uh, this says that if I know or I believe that A and B, then I know and I know that A and I know that B. In terms of semantics, you still have uh, you still have you still have uh, more than a, an epistemic standard. The point is that this formula states that if there is an epistemic standard making true jointly A and B, then possibly, not possibly, then you have 
an epistemic standard making A, tr a true and an epistemic standard making B true, okay? For example, there is an epistemic standard making A and B true, for example, television show, R1. Uh, another uh, standard making R2, which makes uh, uh, B true. And there is a third standard which makes them bo uh, 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 jointly uh, through both, right? It must be the, the same standard. Pa pardon? It must be the same epistemic standard. No, it's not, because each time you have a box, namely um, uh, uh, the operator, you, in theory uh, you, have, you may have a different standard. Okay, so, um, I, I, but, I mean, look, um, okay, A is true in Z and in S and in W, right? These are the three words. B is true in V and is true in a word in Z, again, okay? The, 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 the accessibility relation which makes uh, A true is R3 because R3 is the, the accessibility relation which max, maps precisely the words where A is true. Okay? R3 maps W, I'm reasoning in W, right? Uh, Z, S, and at W itself, because you have, you know, this is a reflexive world, right? So it's C itself. Okay, R2 uh, makes true B, because all words where B is true are mapped by R2. So uh, here I'm, I'm sure that the consequent is true, because there is a standard making precisely mapping the words where A is true, this one. And this is R3. And there is a standard mapping precisely the words where B is true. This one. So the consequent is true. So the schema is true. I don't need to check whether the antecedent is true because if the consequent is true, it's true the schema. Okay? Hmm? Uh, but you know, intuitively, the schema I think is quite easy. It, it, I, I, can you give me an intuitive example where if I don't, if I believe A and B, then I don't believe A or I don't believe B. If I believe jointly A and B, then I believe A and I believe B. Okay? In fact, this is a schema which is not discussed in epistemic logic. It's taken, to, it's taken, it's taken for granted. Okay? Uh, other more significant steps, for example, this schema. Uh, this schema means, uh, this is a, a symbol used in, in modern logic to express tautology, any truth, right? Which is always true, okay? So this sentence is very strong, it's very interesting in epistemic logic, it says that the agent knows everything which is tautological. Yeah? This is something divine, let's say. It's very difficult to say, to ascribe this to humans, okay? Uh, so this is a schema we should accept. Okay, and uh, sorry, this is a mistake. And okay, these are some some um, some slides which we can skip. Another schema which is very important to approach divine divine knowledge is the is the opposite of the other one. If I know or I believe that A and I know or believe that B, then I know and I believe A and B. So I agglomerate knowledge now. I, I don't, I'm not distributing knowledge over the conjunction. Intuitively, this seems to be harm, uh, harmless as well. No, it's not harmless. It's a very powerful schema. Because this schema allows for making explicit cognitive dissonances. If I know or I believe A, and I know or I believe not A, then I know or I believe A and not A, which is a contradiction. So this schema, in other words, makes explicit contradictions, epistemic contradictions, and, in other words, uh, makes standards inconsistent. You know? Because this states that there is a standard, there, is, there exists a sta an epistemic standard 
where A and not A is true. But this is not possible because this is a contradiction. Okay? So this is a very powerful schema. Okay? Okay, this is just technical stuff, we can, we can leave it. This, doesn't, this is just an example showing you know, a, a structure where the schema is, is, is true, but I think we can skip it. The, the important thing is that you get, you, you, get, you get the intuition, right? Did, did you get you know, the basic intuition? Because otherwise, if you get the basic intuition, we can skip this, 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 this stuff. Otherwise... Define basic intuition. The ba very basic. So, the, what, what is important is that you understand whether a plurality of relations make, makes agent human. And as soon as you reduce, you reduce the number of, 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 of uh, standards, epistemic standards, you basically are, are approaching divine knowledge, right? In fact, the previous schema uh, is called agglomeration. So it says that you have two different relations, we, you, you can agglomerate two different relations into a single uh, 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 standard, which means that basically you are contributing somehow to reduce the number of standards, somehow. So I, can, I decide to skip, okay? It's just to illustrate the point. Okay, when you have agglomeration schema, the other schema you, I have uh, shown, namely the, the schema uh, box top, knowledge of, uh, of tautologies, and the other harmless schema, namely distribution, distribution of the of knowledge and belief over the conjunction, then you are in system K, which is well known in model logic. This is a very standard system. When you arrive here, you have first great achievement. You have removed standards. Because in K, you have just a single accessibility relation. So you, don't have, you no longer have more accessibility standards. Yeah. I see, see the system C, the, the schema C is the agglomeration uh, schema. The, the schema according to which you say box A and box B implies box A and B. Okay? This is C. So actually, if you take, if you add C, which is, uh, I don't have a whiteboard, anyway, uh, the agglomeration, the agglomeration uh, schema to the other schema I mentioned, then you get K, the system K. The system K is is, is uh, a normal system. From system K upwards, so system K is the, the weakest normal system, you have only one accessibility relate, only one type of arrow, namely only one epistemic standard. You know, we are approaching, we are approaching divine go knowledge in the sense that in humans you may have more standards. In God, hopefully, you will have just a single standard, <laughs> right? But in, in, in reality, in God, you will need no standard at all. Okay. So, a uh, normal epistemic logic, glimpsing heaven, it, well, you know, we are approaching, but still far away. There are, we need other schemata. This is the first important schemata, which is well known in modern logic, very well studied in modern logic. But, you know, but in, 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 in epistemic logic, it has a particular meaning. Um, in modern logic, you used to, to, mod, to distinguish between knowledge and belief. According to Jaco Intica's approach to the notion of knowledge and belief, you know, knowledge is true belief. Okay? The difference between knowledge and belief is that belief can be false. Okay? I can believe that it is raining, right? Now it's not raining. But I can't say I'm, I know that, it's, that it, it, it is raining because it, knowledge implies truth, right? So this schema says, if I believe that A, then A. If, I, if we accept this schema, we no, we no longer have no, we no longer have beliefs, we, we have knowledge. Does it make sense to have no belief in God? Does it make sense to say that God believes possibly something which is false? Can you imagine that God, 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 God believes that it is raining now? Look, at, look out, out, out the window. I, is it raining? I can't believe. Uh, I don't believe. So. Okay, but it's human because it's human. But it, no, 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 I, I can't even. Okay, that is a question for you guys. I mean, th uh, it's a question for you guys. I mean, can you say that God believes falsehoods? 
Remember, it was uh, planting a definition of, uh, uh, you know, uh, planting an intuition about divine knowledge, right? Yeah. Okay. In fact, this schema, in, in the perspective of God, captures the notion of infallibility. It's a very s- simple way for modeling inf- God's infallibility. Well, we, don't, we need it. At least this is our, this is our perspective. Uh, interestingly enough, when we have this schema, which is called T in model logic, we, don't, we, are not, we are no longer in trouble in case of conflict. Because we, we, ca- we cannot have them. Because as soon as I believe that A, this means that A is true. But this means that it is impossible to know contradictions. Okay? If I'm infallible, I can't believe what is false. Okay? So this schema forces the logic to be consistent, logically consistent. In fact, it, T corresponds to the class of frames, reflect, reflect, reflexive frames, and reflexivity is a type of seriality, if you are familiar with model logic. So there is nothing strange here from a technical perspective. But I don't, I don't, I'm not interested in the technical stuff now. It, just stick to the intuition, right? Do you agree on the schema? Do you think it's, it, we need it for modeling uh, divine knowledge? I mean, epistemic infallibility. Other two schemata are this one, well known also in epistemic logic. They capture the notion of introspection, epistemic introspe- introspection. Uh, they are called in model logic four and five. Well, four states that if I, now we are operating with knowledge, we are working with knowledge. So forget about belief, right? We have T now. So we know that God, God, uh, in God we don't have belief, we only have knowledge. Okay, so box now means knowledge. Okay, uh, if I know A, this, this schema says, states that if I know A, then I know that I know A. This is called in epistemic logic, positive introspection. So the agent, the knower, is aware of his knowledge, right? If you want, uh, okay, no, forget about it in a moment. So, do you think it's possible? Do you think we need it in case of God? Do you think God is, is unaware of His knowledge? Could be meaning, meaningfully say that God is not aware of what, what, what He knows. I'm not a theologian, so uh, for me, it's, as, as a logician, this, we, cannot, we cannot give up this principle if we want to define full, full omniscience. In epistemic logic, if you want to have full extreme omniscience, you need it. I don't think we can, we cannot, as a theologian I would say, well, I, assuming that no is, a, is a, unaware of his knowledge implies that he's not perfect. Yeah? Yeah, I think, uh, I'm not a theologian or a logician, but um, my gut feeling is that uh, uh, you have, that theologians would say that God doesn't have knowledge, but God is knowledge. Okay, yeah, uh, give me a couple of slides. Give me a couple of slides. <laughs> Wait a couple of slides. You know, the, 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 I mean, the, stra- the, st- the strategy, my strategy is quite clear. I mean, um, to me, it was, it was nice to proceed from the weakest, uh, weakest version of uh, omniscience to the strongest, the strongest one. We are approaching the strongest, but we are not yet arrived. At, 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 uh, heaven is, 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 is still far away. Okay? But, you know, to, to build heaven, you need building blocks, right? So you need building blocks to define the different components. So if you agree on, on this analytical method... But you could, you could spell the, the, the law number three. Yeah. You mean this one? No, no number three. From, from the uh, earlier... Uh, ah, the previous one? Yeah. yeah. And it means if I know A for God, if, if God knows A, it is equivalent to A. But yeah, but it's the opposite. But if you want to put... Opposite. Yeah, yeah you, 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 exactly. Third implies this, yes? No, uh, T doesn't imply this. 
T, the previous schema, doesn't imply this. Yeah, the previous schema implies four. Doesn't. Yes. If, if you strengthen three to, to the... You have to... Because you oh, yes, yes? Yes, yes. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, so... Uh, this is... Uh, okay. Okay, this is one... Okay, so I think positive introspection, fine. Uh, what about negative introspection? Negative introspection is much more intriguing. In epistemic logic, it's, to be, it's taken to be an example of introspection, right? If I don't know A, then I know that I don't know A. And it is in the case of God false because the antecedent is always false. Can't be yeah, but I'm not. True. Yeah, but I'm, I'm not claiming that the antecedent is, is is true. I'm claiming that whenever the antecedent is, is true, then the consequent is true. I'm, this this schema now this schema this schema doesn't state that this is this is true. It's like you know uh, it's like a Grotius argument about the natural law. You know, are familiar with this in the prolegomena of the uh, the Jura Belliac Pacis, where Grotius argued that the truth of our, truth of arithmetics exists even even if even uh, if God does not exist. Of course, uh, uh, Grotius say, uh, adds, of course I'm not claiming that God, God doesn't, does not exist. God exists, but if God uh, uh, does not exist, this truth could, be, could, be, could, be, could, could, could hold as well. So I'm not claiming that God, God does, does not know something. I'm saying that in the hypothetical situation, which has never happened, Okay? In the hypothetical, the counterfactual, take it as a counterfactual read. In the counterfactual situation where God doesn't know something, God should know it. Of course, never, this never happened. But admitting if the incompleteness of, uh, okay? Because if you don't admit this, God is not perfect. God, there is something that God cannot know. It, it is ignorance. So you should need it, otherwise you, you don't have full knowledge, right? This is very much intriguing. I mean, it's quite plain epistemic logic, but it's quite intriguing in, in case of divine knowledge, right? But you, you need it. Oh, yes, sorry? Just one quick question. Yeah. Uh, sorry, yeah, I moved very much. You were able to get rid of the notion of belief, because you said, well, Whatever God believes, He knows, because He has no false beliefs. Exactly. That's how you got rid of, of the notion of belief. Yeah. You said we don't need it. Then here it's the same thing. No, no, it's not, this, this is not belief. Sorry. I'm just referring to the schema number four. Yeah. If there is no knowledge, there is no God's knowledge of which He would not be aware, then you don't need four. At least hypothetically, you need a knowledge of who. At least hypothetically, you need something that God knows but doesn't know that He knows it. Otherwise, you don't really need number four. That's my preoccupation. Yeah, but this is. This is uh, you could, I think you mix up incompleteness and, and, and false beliefs. You, you, may, you, may no, you may not know something, even though this something is true. Okay. Yeah. I mean, this sentence states that there is a type of no, there is a type of fact which sh you should know. This type of fact is your own knowledge. Okay. So if you don't have four, then you have an incomplete knowledge. Schema T, box A implies A, doesn't address directly the, the, the problem of completeness of the knowledge. Address the problem of correctness of knowledge because it forces knowledge, it forces beliefs to be true. Okay? So there are different aspects of the same coin. Um, four and five are schemata that uh, uh, are meant to capture the fact that knowledge is complete somehow because they are explaining that if God knows something that should know that. And that, if God doesn't know something, he should know that. So they are 
um, schemata are meant to characterize the notion of perfect knowledge in terms of complete no knowledge, right? Schema T, no, schema T is about the correctness. Okay? You may be correct, but incomplete. You may, all your beliefs are correct, but you, you don't know everything. Probably you, you, could, you, you, you cannot know that, uh, you cannot know your own beliefs, your own knowledge. Okay? So there are different aspects. Okay? Okay. Uh, well, if we are in, the, in, this, in this situation, so we have all these schemata, so imagine to, to add, you have, a, you have a, a magic box, you put all these schemata and you shake, then what you get is system S5, which is the strongest, one of the strongest, no, it's not the strongest in, in reality, one of the strongest systems in modern logic, which is in epistemic logic very powerful. You know, this is more the description of the system, but it's not important. Because in this system, from a semantic point of view, we get rid of the unique accessibility relation we had. Okay? There are two different versions of S5. One where we have an accessibility relation which is. Uh, we, uh, which, we, we, uh, sorry? Equivalence. Equivalence, it's, exactly, because we have reflexivity, transitivity, okay. EQ, uh, okay. So it's a, it basically, the, the set of words is a class, is an equivalence class, right? But this is, mathematic, this is mathematically equivalent to a class of frames where you don't have, a, you no longer have the accessibility relation, or rather, you may have it, but you, you don't use it to evaluate formulas, right? In fact, S5 is called a universal modality. So in universal modality, you have this. Imagine you have these words. They are not connected, but in fact, to evaluate box A, you say that box A is true in a world, if and only if, for all worlds, these words make a, make a true. You, don't, you no longer use the notion of accessibility relations. You, you get rid of accessibility. So it, you no longer have even a unique epistemic standard. Okay? So in other words, in this situation, to, 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 validate, to validate a box formula, you just need this. You just have to check whether in all words A is true. You no longer need to refer to the accessibility relation. Yeah? Because the equivalence class, the cluster of equivalent worlds, is equivalent mathematically to having no relation at all in evaluating the box. Okay? Which is very interesting because you know this you know is a step forward in God we don't have any epistemic standard. That doesn't make any sense to have epistemic standards. What, what do you mean by epistemic perspective? in God. There's no epistemic perspective. Okay? The idea of perspective is always pertaining to those who are ignorant. A double, big W means uh, the, the class of the world. The class of the world. We still have the worlds. In cryptic frame. Exactly. We still have the worlds. But the point is that all worlds are epistemically equivalent. Yes. So you don't, you, don't need, you don't need to travel from one world to another world because in each world you are, you get the same, the, the same results. Okay? Okay? Somehow. Uh, okay. But... Now, this is the final step. You know, so far we have described the notion of uh, logical, logical uh, omniscience. Because all this stuff is basically meant to model the fact that an agent knows theorems. You know, pl classical logic is very good for modeling uh, theorem hood in mathematics. But, you know, we need something more, right? We need something more. We need to move from theorem hood to contingent facts. Because God, God, of course, knows all theorems. Everything which is implied by a knowledge base, which is logically implied by a knowledge base. But what we need is that God knows all facts, independently of whether these facts correspond to tautologies, theorems, or whatever, right? Everything. Okay, so the first version of maximality, now we are, get, we are approaching the notion of maximality. The first version is this, is this axiom schema. 
which, which we called factual knowledge. I mean, I, we, we didn't, to the best of our knowledge, nobody so far investigated this schema. Okay? Um, this schema says that for, a, every fo for any formula A, independently of the status of this formula, theorem, contingent truth, the agent knows A or knows not A. This is a, a, a version of, a, a, is, a, is, is a epistemic version of the law of excluded middle, right? And it's basically what you do, more or less, when you build, you know, a, a canonical model in completeness proof. You know, you have to saturate the words and add either A or not A. But this is just a technical note. It's not, it's not what. I mean, this is a very, a very strong schema. It states that the knower knows A or not A. So it covers all, all possible formulas, all possible statements, independently of whether they are tautologies, theorems, or whatever. Um, well, this is a condition. I mean, this, the, the condition why, the condition under which the, 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 the schema is, is validated is, is funny because uh, actually, well, I, can give you the, I can give you the picture, I think. Okay. What we have to uh, assume is that every world can at most reach another world, only one another, only one world. I'm, I'm now characterizing the notion of factual knowledge not in S5. Remember, in S5, we assume that there is no, lo no, lo there is no longer an accessibility relation. But now I'm trying to clarify the meaning of the schema in itself, without, without committing to, to the, the full uh, system S5, right? I'm now characterizing the schema in itself. And this is the, 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 semantic, the semantic condition. Um, another point is that this schema, together with infallibility, this is infallibility, okay? It's just the, the, the contraposition, right? Remember, infallibility means box A implies A. Remember, belief A implies A. Okay, you can just the contraposition, right? A implies not box, not A. You just take T, you have the contraposition, you add the, the negation, and you get this. So in other words, this is T, right? In presence, in, do, do you see it? No. Okay. Contraposition um, of this. This is this is this. this, this, this uh, no, 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 no! Don't forget about this. This is the contraposition of box A implies A. Reverse the formula. Not A implies not box A. Replace A with not A, and you get yes, this. Yes, yes. Okay. Okay, in other words, this is infallibility, yeah, but it's, it's, uh, it's, it's just reframed in, uh, in the, contrapo in the, the con contrapositive version. In, why, why, why I mention this? Because when you have infallibility, when you have infallibility and you have factual knowledge, you get this. If A is true, then I know it. I know that A is true. Do you want this for God? Absolutely. Yes. God, remember one of the definitions in the first slide, God knows everything which is true. The fact that I, the fact that I have knowledge, a, uh, box A implies A, is infallibility, but doesn't guarantee that we have complete knowledge. Doesn't guarantee, guarantees that God is infallible, doesn't, doesn't believe something which is false. But we need something more. We need maximality. Everything is true is known by God. If A is true, then no, God knows it. Okay? And the second formula? This formula is a tautology. It's just a you have a factual knowledge, which is a form of maximality. Okay? Because for every formula, uh, the, the, the agent knows, knows the formula of the, of the, of the negation. This is a tautology, it's just a reframing. Yeah, I, I understood it differently because I thought it, it is a kind of tautology. But it is a, uh, in modern logic, if something is possible, it implies that something is necessary. Yes? The second. Yeah, you're right. You're right. This is, this is good, 
point, yes. good point. Yes. This is fact, and a new way, it is a different way of thinking about factual knowledge. Yes. Factual knowledge says that if it's possible, then it is necessary. But remember, we are not talking about uh, athletic necessity, we are talking about epistem epi yes. epistemic state, epistemic attitudes, right? Yes. Um, so we get this. So in fact, when you have maximality as expressed by factual knowledge and you add infallibility, you get this one. This is what we want. Uh, you may have a different approach. You can forget about factual knowledge and directly, goes, uh, directly go to this one. Okay? Which is uh, we we, we call the uh, Anselm principle because uh, there is uh, a paper there are some works where the Athletic version of this uh, schema are used to model uh, Anselm's argument for the existence of God, but they use the Athletic version, not the epistemic version. It is funny, interesting that we use the same schema for modeling uh, omniscience, right? Um, in this case, we have. Uh, and other conditions, slightly different, uh, but I think we can skip the, the, the technical stuff. What is, what is interesting that in general, this I think is important, you, you should bear in mind this, you have two possibilities, this depends on the semantic condition that validate the two schemata. So, Anselm schemata, or factual knowledge, which is the other one, box A or box not A, okay? In general, factual knowledge is stronger than Anselm principle, so this is weaker than the other one. This is weaker than the other one. Factual knowledge is stronger. I mean, the, the schema saying that possible implies necess necessary, right? Um, because in all, in all, fray, in fray, in all uh, models where factual knowledge is true, Anselm principle is true as well. If you want to have the, the, the other direction, so answer, answer principle implies factual knowledge, you may have it only if you assume infallibility. But the point is that, can, you, can we give up in God infallibility? No. So, factual knowledge and answer principle are equivalent. No way. They say precisely the same thing. Okay? They, they are completely equivalent, because the cost to pay to differentiate them is to say that we don't have infallibility. Hmm? And then, if you have that, we have exactly what you said at the beginning. We have that A is equivalent to knowledge A. But if we have that, Basically, we uh, make uh, epistemic logic collapse into ca classical propositional logic. So we don't need epistemic logic. Is it good or is it bad? As, an, as a logician, I don't care. <laughs> uh, as a theologian, probably it's nice to understand whether we, we have to, to do that. Probably because in God doesn't make sense to, to, to speak about knowledge. Knowledge is, is, is just... A human concept, you know. But when we speak about God, we don't need the notion of knowledge. But this is, you know, this is tri intriguing because, you know, in, in that sense, omniscience doesn't make sense. So when we speak about God, we are speaking about omniscience. But we we think we think of God as omniscient because we are humans, and so we are ignorant. But in God, does it make sense to say that there is omniscience because God, you know, God is. God, God doesn't know. God is. So we don't need uh, any types of, of epistemic notion. And in some sense, omniscience is, is a human notion. It's not a divine notion. So I'm not a theologian, but uh, when I arrived at this, uh, when we arrived at this conclusion in modern logic, I said, well, look, fantastic. Uh, from a the logical perspective, basically, you don't need model logic <laughs> when you model. But the point is that to realize that you don't need model logic, you first have to use it, to push it at its extreme, and then realize that you, you don't need it. What I, I'm skeptical when people argue that you don't need it, but they don't know why they don't need it. Okay? Okay, that's it. <laughs>